But the stories are going to be amazing. You're going to love the stories that all of these amazing storytellers are going to share with you. And without further ado, let me call to the mic our first storyteller, Timothy, Timothy David Ray. No demand for the black Irish. Her name was Olwyn, Olwyn Griffith. It was the summer of 1993 and she had come like so many Irish before her on a year long visa with a dream of immigration and an attempt to flee Ireland's poor economy and lack of jobs. Olwyn and I met as waiters on one of Chicago's new world-class dinner cruise ships that catered to the whining and dining set. The types who wanted to pretend they were sailing down the French Riviera instead of slugging along the Chicago River in the sweltering heat of Midwestern August. Olwyn was of the Irish sturdy peasant stock, and I don't think she'd mind me telling you that. With her short squat body, dusty brown hair, and a devilish grin, she took no crap from anyone. Olwyn was always good for practical advice. She didn't mince words or twist them. After a long shift waiting tables on the boat, as managers barked orders to carry heavy table down the ship's deck for storage, Olwyn would pass me by and whisper in my ear, follow me. What? Just do it. Just start walking around the ship so you look busy. <laughs> Olwyn called this the walk of importance. That way we don't have to lug heavy tables to and fro. I mean, really, to put us through that weary load, like Christ himself to Calvary, it just isn't fair. Yes, she was a charmer. But despite all our working, we rem remained poor in a cramped little apartment run by Irish landlords on Halstead and Barry. I had come to Chicago one year earlier to find fame and fortune as an actor, and she had come over to break into production and radio and television, and the both of us were having very little luck. Hey, I finally announced one afternoon in early fall, I just got cast in this educational music theater workshop that tours the school with an anti-drug message for teens, and it pays! Ah, Jesus, good on ya. Uh, what part will you be playing, and when do you start? Well, it's not really a part, not yet. It's for an understudy for the lead. Oh, groaned Olwen in what would become her signature sound of disapproval. Understudy, understudy won't put food on the table and fire in the furnace, now will it? Oh, I know these artist types with their fancy hats and flowing robes. They don't care a lick about you. They'd rather see you starve than put you on to pay the bills and have a crust of bread to call your own. Now, Tim, I don't mean to mash your dreams, but, uh, well, what is the play called? Captain Clean, How to Be a Clean Teen. <laughs> oh, sounds a bit shaky, but suit yourself. Well, Owen was right. The producer playwright never did put me on, but when I wanted to quit the show, she didn't want to let me go either. She wants to go and talk over lunch. She's trying to get over on you. That's what she wants. Eh, do whatever you want. They're always looking out for themselves. Captain Clean, indeed. Later that afternoon, I crept back into the apartment and found Owen sitting, waiting for me at the big wooden cable spool, our only furniture in the place. She took one look at me and blurted out, you gave in to her, didn't you? I can tell by the look on your face, but she bought me lunch and everything, dessert with cappuccinos. Eh, no matter. We've got bigger problems to sort out here, and bigger problems indeed. Soon Chicago's horrible winter bore down on us, taking the restaurant business through its slow period and forcing Owen and I to put starve back into starving artist. I'm so hungry, Olwen was known to groan. I could eat a small child. <laughs> but in the original Olwen fashion, she concocted a plan to save money and stretch food. 
What was it, I wondered? Some detailed fiscal plan? An ancient secret derived from the years of the potato famine? Owen reached up into the bare cupboards and pulled out a bottle of whiskey and poured two hefty shots into a mug. There you are. Now drink it down. Like mother's milk it'll be. You'll sleep like a bag and won't wake up till noon. There. I've just saved some money off our morning meal. Then we'll make a casserole like the Italians full of corn and such and feed off that for a week. Oh, Jesus, it's brilliant to get us through this. The winter of our discontent. The winter of our discontent. That's what we called it and that whiskey and casserole got us by. We drank and ate our way through every made-for-TV movie, all when a form of film student deconstructed deliverance, danced around the apartment to toot sweet from Chitty Chitty Bang Bang, and waited in absolute anticipation for the BBC's next installment, with Laura Linney as a Marianne Singleton discovering a very homosexual 70s San Francisco, and Amis and Maupin's Tales of the City. We even managed to scrape a few pennies together to see Disney's newest adventured Lion King. I felt like that little lion was me, Owen bawled at the movie theater, just scratching and making his way in the world, climbing up that peak and, and triumphing over all. The winter drew on. Owen told me about Irish culture. I told her about race in America. She recounted Ireland's religious strife. I talked about being gay and not totally comfortable with it. We argued race, politics, and viewpoints, swapped stories and disagreed. What was really going on in that little apartment? Distractions from disappointments and enough grace to get us through. One night, Owen crept to my room, her oversized t-shirt and short, and knelt at my foot and mattress. I had a dream. About what? One of the servers on the boat. A girl! Owen launched into a hot and heavy detail of a vision. And then I kissed her. I kissed her in the dream, oh Tim. What do you think it means? Do you think I'm a, a lesbian? <laughs> she said lesbian as if she had just uncovered one of the pod people from Invasions of the Body Snatchers. <laughs> I, I don't know, I mean, so what if you are? It's not a fate worse than death. Ah, oh, Jesus, I couldn't be. I just, well, if I am, what my parents think and my friends? I didn't have an answer for that. I didn't know how lesbianism fit into the Irish canon of sinners and saints. <laughs> Summer seemed to come quickly, and Olwyn's visa had run out. Her immigration dream would have to wait. Olwyn went to visit her sister in New York just before her move. And back in Chicago, a week later, Olwyn and I stood awkwardly on the curb outside the apartments on Halstead and Barrie. Me in a blue bandana and long gray t-shirt and she in a colorful flock, waiting for the final items to be packed into the moving van. You know, Tim, said Owen, when I was in New York, my sister took me to this gospel church, a black lesbian choir, and I was sitting there, listening to the music, and all of a sudden, I got up on my feet, and I started swaying and, and clapping along. I mean, I got it. Or maybe uh, I thought I did, and, and I said to myself, I'm doing this because of Tim. I'm doing this for having known you. And as she and the van drove away, I let that sink in just for a little while with just enough humility to satisfy. The Irish, if nothing else, are great storytellers. And they have a saying that goes, a thing is better off shared. Owen and I recently reconnected on Facebook after years of not knowing what the other was up to. When I told her I was doing this tonight, she wanted to make sure that I told you about Captain Clean and that she's on her second girlfriend. 